Hello again, everybody. This is Steve uh, coming to you with another uh, lesson on writing. And this, you know, this deals with world building still, which a lot of what you're going to be doing when you're writing is doing world building. Because uh, you've got to build the world and then you can write about it. Uh, but in this case, I'm going to be talking about something that I've noticed a lot of people don't think about, or if they think about it, they don't put a lot of thought into it, which is kind of unfortunate because this is a major driving element of stories and a lot of people don't think that but then would you look at it look at real life what is the one of the major driving elements of real life well it's the economy you go to you go out to work you work your you know, your eight hour shift your 10 hour shift however many hours it is uh and you get paid for that you bring that money home you use that to pay your electric bill you use it to buy food uh maybe you hire somebody in turn to do something for you like yard work or things like that and everything in the world is driven by money and the economy uh, it's one of many driving factors there's a lot of things it's not just money in the economy that drives things but it is an important factor because if money stops flowing things stop happening and people suffer uh, nations collapse people collapse things like that uh, first thing I will say is money is not necessarily uh, what do I want to say here? Money is not necessarily a uh, you know like dollar bills or gold coins or stuff like that. Uh, if you look at ancient Mayans, I think I think what they said from uh, what the historians have said was ninety eight percent of their economy was barter. Ninety percent of it was. Uh, they did use gold and silver like uh, coins like you would normally think or if not gold and silver coins then it was like gold and silver trinkets uh pieces you know bars uh they might have a nugget things like that they used that for trade but th the primary method of trade was direct barter and that could be like i have uh, a bundle of tobacco dried tobacco you have six dozen eggs i'll trade you this bundle of tobacco for those six dozen eggs that's economy that's money that's a method of transaction uh, now like I say in more modern societies transactions can be done digitally especially in high-tech societies they can be done digitally uh, they can be done through paper money they can be done through coinage uh, you can still do barter although the primary method of exchange is through a digital medium because you can either do direct barter and exchange or you can use a medium like a coin or something else like that to facilitate that facilitate that transaction uh, because you can you know you can go out and gather all of your own things that you need you know you can raise your own crops you can uh, slaughter your own animals uh, if you're vegetarian you can uh, you can you know like if, well going back to the raising crops you can raise your own crops you can raise your own food uh, make your own clothing stuff like that you can do all of that stuff for yourself however in a high functioning society regardless if it's you know uh, hyper advanced or really medieval simple barter and trade is a major element because not everybody has the skills to go out and make clothing and make tools and do iron and things like that some of them don't you know a lot of people don't have access to those things uh, so, you know they may not have the ability to get stone but somebody else can therefore barter and trade is necessary so that one person can get the thing that they need in exchange for something that they have that the, that the person with the stone happens to have you know, like if if you've got a side of beef and you need three you need three hundred uh, bricks, then okay, here's my, here's that side of beef. I'll take that three hundred bricks from you, and you're extra, you're exchanging labor and product in doing that. Because you know the bricks take labor to produce, the side of beef takes labor to to raise it. Uh, it re requires resources. It requires effort to butcher it. Uh, if I'm grossing out you vegetarians I apologize but I'm just stating how the world works here uh, and one thing about it too is markets play markets are concentrated points of exchange 
uh, and you can be like in a high-tech society you could have like something like this might be a high-tech market that's multiple levels people come in on spaceships they walk inside they tour it around like a Nord they tour around it like a Nordstrom's and you know I'll take this I'll take that beep, 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 couple buttons electronic money is exchanged and they walk away with the item that they need now oops and again um, You know, and then you could have a metropolitan city like this, where uh, now some of you, especially if you're from the big city, you'd be more familiar with this. You know, you can go down the go down the street. You got the big supermarket you can buy from. You've got the little local deli. Uh, you've got uh, transportation. That's part of your economy because you know you can walk there. You can go there on your under your own means, uh, be that a car, a horse, whatever it is, or you can get public transportation. You can hire a taxi. There's, you know, but in the end, you're still exchanging money for uh, resources. Same thing with if you're in a space station like this, this could, you know, like that. Because uh, if you think about like the the, the uh, Pluto Pluto station I have uh, in Earthfleet, you know, you could have like this could be the big mechanical section, or this could be mechanical section and stores. Uh, this could be a promenade where a lot of the stores are at. Uh, maybe this is just a trade hub where. One dude rolls in with a cargo full of, uh, say, bananas, and somebody else has got a cargo full, uh, cargo of nuts and bolts. And hey, I need that for one of my destinations. I'll buy that off in exchange for the bananas. You know, like I said, it's a high tech society, but it's still the basics of trade. You know, and that can go for something that if you're into the fantasy stuff, and, you, and uh, in the fantasy stuff, you're going to very rarely see high tech sci fi stuff. You're going to see a lot of this medieval market type stuff guy selling a wheel of cheese to some lady who's out hunting for food for din dinner uh, if you notice he's got a full wheel of cheese he's got some smaller samplers so if you don't need the full wheel or you can't afford it you can get a smaller amount of cheese uh, here's one where they're displaying baked goods uh, just an, just basically it, this is like a flea market where you know you have all these little stands each one's offering a, you know only a couple items they're not offering a lot of items uh, like this one would be meats and cheeses which you know like I say if you're gonna see those kind of have those kind of stands in your books you're gonna have a lot of stands that are very specialized you might have somebody just down the way selling fresh chickens that are still alive or freshly butchered you might have somebody down the way who's selling uh, squash and tomatoes it's you know that's gonna be pretty typical in one of those kind of markets uh, markets could be like this too where you've got regular businesses on either side you've got market tents down the middle you've got here this guy's a farmer selling just vegetables this guy's selling meats uh, this guy's selling vegetables not sure what he's selling you could have somebody selling gold and silver you could have them selling swords uh, that's gonna be one of your major things in the book you need to think that think that through because uh, that is going to drive a surprising amount of things you would you would be surprised how much that's actually going to drive in your books which then brings me to my next point is money uh, here's two examples I grabbed from uh, some animes I watched because I liked I liked the idea that they had here for this particular type of uh, a money system and if you're curious this is from uh, I'd call it Reborn as a Bookworm, or, or no, what was it? Not Reborn as a Bookworm, that's a different one. Um, well, if you search for Bookworm anime, it'll come up. I can't remember the full name of it. But anyways, in their world, they have this system of money. It's, they use bronze, silver, and gold. And they have them in different sizes, which would essentially be different weights. Uh, how they get the three different bronze values out of these coins I don't know it might be a purity thing uh, it might be a coin weight which I would think when it comes to metals if you follow ancient history metal or exchanges in, in precious metals was done by weight uh, like a horse might be uh, to use the to use the Jewish form of measurement it might be 30 shekels well, I mean it won't be 30 shekels but let's just say that horse was worth 30 shekels you're, you know, you're going to go over there and you're going to weigh out or weigh out 30 shekels in the valued or in the particular uh, metal that the, 
that the seller wants. Let's say they want 30 shekels of silver. You go over to the scale. He puts the weights on the one side for 30 shekels. You put 30 shekels of silver on the other. When the scales balance, off you go. Uh, this one here, you know, all of the weight, uh, all of the coin weights. I'm assuming are predetermined. You know, they're basically uh, when they stamp them out, considering the quality of the coins based on what I'm seeing here. Uh, I'm assuming they have a, a fairly advanced production environment. Something that, that you know that, like if you look at the Romans, you look at Roman coins. That was basically a chunk of metal, a, st uh, a uh, coin stamp, and two really big beefy dudes with sledgehammers beating on it. They were you know they were not well designed coins. They were basically just a slab of metal that was weighed out. Put into the into the die, and then two guys beat on it until the co until it formed a coin that they wanted, which just happened to have the you know the royal or the imperial symbol on it and stuff like that, making it an official Roman coin. So that's how they did it. These here look to be stamped. Uh, stamping usually means that you are you know the the precious metal is put into a sheet form. And then they stamp out each of these individual coins, and those coins are all, you know, because it's a, it's a specific thickness, and they stamp it out, and each coin has a specific weight. And and then what you do is you take that, uh, what, and when they punch it out, or originally punch it out, it's just a, it's just a blank. It's just a round, uh, well, it's a coin, but it's a, it's a round uh, circle of just metal you know just basically that piece of sheet metal it's just a, a you just stamped out a round circle uh from that from that sheet of metal and then you put that into a stamping die and boom, 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 you know and then that puts that puts the finish on it it puts the the you know the inscription here and other things like that onto the coin so the uh you know, like I say, the breakdown here is small, medium, large, small, big, small, big. And my thinking is, is that the reason that they did small, medium, large is it allows a smaller denomination down here for smaller transactions, whereas you start getting into here, you're into your larger transactions. So it would be kind of like uh, $1, $10, uh, or $1, $5, $10, and then 20, 50, 100, 300, or 400, or 500 dollars, something like that. Just, just as an example of what that, you know, how those would, uh, how those would shake out. And if you look at the, the values here, uh, like a small bronze is 10 uh, leon. Now, the question is, how do you get a smaller uh, denomination than this? Interestingly enough, our ancestors used to take a hammer and a meat cleaver and cut the coins in pieces. And then they would just, you know, figure out, the, like, if you needed uh, something was half a cent, they would literally take a penny, put a meat cleaver on it and a hammer, boom, cut, the ha you know, cut the coin in half. They literally did that. Because uh, that, was, that was just how it was. A penny was worth so much that, you know, you had products that were half a cent. And instead of you buying... You know, like you'd say, like a piece of chewing gum was half a cent each, and you only wanted one. You didn't want two of them. Okay, fine. They cut the penny in half. And of course, since that was a common practice, then the next guy that you came to, you had something that was only half a cent. You gave him the other half of the penny, and off he went. Now the mint kind of frowned on it, but that was just something that they did back in the day uh, when you know stuff was like uber crazy super cheap and if it was like a quarter of a cent they would literally cut it into four quarters and you know you might hand a hand the uh, person taking your money or that you're buying from you'd hand them you know a quarter of a penny so that was that was one of their ways to make change uh, with stuff that was less than a penny I don't know how this system works but I'm assuming if it's a 10 lion they probably have an iron coin that's a one lion I'm guessing iron or lead or something like that that's a smaller denomination this is all this one shows but it's going to be a smaller denomination and then you've got this one this one i forget i think this is uh oh what was this one this was uh i think uh campfire cooking in another world was the anime but anyways this one this one actually breaks it down i think a little bit better 
because you had the iron coin for the smallest, which the other one didn't have. Uh, you have to kind of assume that the one lion coin is going to be probably an iron coin. Uh, and that depends on the availability of iron in that area. It, iron may not be the cheapest metal. It may be a very, you know, more expensive than copper, depending on which is the most available metals. Uh, and then you might also have uh, things that are like wooden coins. Because, I mean, we used to actually have in America, we used to have wooden nickels. And, uh, you know, that was, f I, I, you know, admittedly that wasn't worth five cents, but it did have value and it was used for exchange. Uh, wasn't used a lot. You don't see it used a lot in history, but there were uh, situations where wooden nickels were used. They weren't just some kind of little trinket like, oh, it's only worth a wooden nickel. The, the, the saying, that saying has kind of gotten uh, misunderstood over time because that wooden nickel did have value. It was used in exchange. It's just that, uh, you know, people will be like, you know, it's not worth a wooden nickel or it's not worth a plug nickel. The idea being that was the smallest, absolute smallest denomination you could get was that wooden nickel. And uh, because of that, when they'd say it wasn't worth a wooden nickel, it wasn't worth a plug nickel, it means it wasn't even worth that tiny, tiny denomination. So hence the, the saying, and that was, that's a thing that's been lost to history. Uh, and also wooden nickels were not official mint uh, coinage. It weren't coin, you know, actual coinage or official U.S. currency or U.S. tender. That was something that people made up and used locally, just as a way to go sub one cent. Because uh, there were situations where those wooden nickels uh, were actually useful for really, really small scale purchases, where you wanted, you only wanted a very little amount of something, or that's all you could afford. And you had a wooden nickel or two, so you could buy, you know, you would have enough to buy that item. So it was a base way of taking the smallest denomination and making the, you know, creating something that was even smaller than that. So, but in this case, uh, iron coin is the, is the smallest one. Again, yours might be different. Uh, it depends on what the most common elements are in an area. Uh, you could come up with other smaller denominations if you needed to go smaller than an iron coin. Because uh, there are ways to go smaller than that. It, like I said, again, it depends on what the primary materials are in your area. You might have something that is uh, a type of, you know, maybe like a a piece, especially stamped piece of leather that has a lesser value than an iron coin. You know, you could have somebody that goes around and you know they're like, well, I want to buy this item. Okay, that'll be one coin and three cockatoo feathers. Okay, here's three feathers, here's the iron coin, I'll take my item now. So, um, and the other thing too is like iron is the, the tech, usually the cheapest coin because it's also usually the most abundant in most cases, not always. Uh, copper is an interesting one because sometimes you have copper, sometimes you have brass, sometimes you have bronze. Again, it depends on how easy is it for them to make, do they have the materials to make it? And, uh, you know, what is its market value? Uh, I've seen money systems where copper and bronze or copper and brass or brass and bronze. I've seen all, and, you know, all of those combinations. And I've seen some where it's copper, brass, and bronze. And it comes down to kind of the, uh, well, because brass and bronze are alloys, whereas copper is a pure material. Uh, you can also take those coins and you can blend them with other things. Uh, for Now, not everything alloys together. There are some materials that just do not like to play with each other like oil and water. I'm not a metallurgist, so I can't tell you which ones those are. But those, you know, those, I, or those uh, coins, or those coins, excuse me, those metals, you know, cannot be used for a... Uh, for an alloy to create a, a different uh, a different value of currency, a different value of coin. Now, one of the things that Rome did in ancient times is when they started out during the height of the empire, their gold coins were gold coins. They were like, because they didn't have electrolysis, so they couldn't do like 99.99% like we can. 
theirs I think was 92 to 98 percent pure 98 being kind of rare because it was even hard to get get that you were more likely to get a 92 percent pure coin, gold coin than you were 98 percent I mean if you really knew what you were doing and you really got lucky you could get 98 percent purity uh, but typically though you were looking at around 92 percent uh, towards the latter part of the empire because the the government was suffering and they were having trouble getting gold and silver in and stuff like that they took their gold coins and their silver coins and they cut them what I mean what I mean by cutting them is they weren't 92 percent pure they were something like 50 percent pure and 30 percent pure and the irony of the whole thing was it created a uh, it created inflation because you could have 30 gold coins uh, it like uh, you know the peak of the Empire which is you know like just before uh, the end of the BC period and early into like the first hundred years of the AD period it was you know there the empire was at its absolute peak and then it kind of started going downhill after that so like if, say for example 1 AD you could have 30 gold coins and they were valued at 30 gold coins or like if they were one ounce of gold each they would be valued at 30 ounces of gold towards the end of the empire like the three four hundreds AD that 92 percent was down I think as low as 30 percent so your 30 ounces of gold coins might only be three ounces of actual gold which I my math might be off on that but uh, yeah I think it's off a little bit on that but anyways basically you now have 30 gold coins just like before but you don't have as much gold therefore what you could buy with 30 gold coins in 1 AD you might need you know a hundred two hundred three hundred gold coins to buy in 300 AD so you know inflation through devaluation another thing to consider um, one other thing too that you also want to think about is which goes into the whole barter and trade thing is you have shipping uh, fantasy does this a lot you don't see it so much in sci-fi but it, it is there it is a thing but not as much as it is in fantasy because I think in fantasy uh, well in fantasy what you have is you have traveling merchants which in sci-fi you don't have traveling merchants so much as you have a shipping system like you'll have a, a merchant in one sector or on one planet or something and you'll have a merchant on another they get on the radio or subspace or whatever they happen to use for communication work out a deal and one guy buys the product from the other guy money's exchanged electronically the the seller then puts a, puts the uh, the purchased item onto a ship that ship takes it over to the uh, other planet drops it off to the guy who just bought it so you don't have the you know you don't have the traveling merchants like you do in fantasy but in fantasy those traveling merchants also act as the supply line because what they will do is in the process of their moving you know the process of their moving from city to city to sell their goods they're also moving product around and you don't have I mean you do have dedicated supply trains but in most cases you're in you know in fantasy not everything obviously I'm, I'm generalizing here but in fantasy generally you will have everything you need local your supply lines are going to be very local they're not going to be regional they're not going to be uh, generally not going to be region regional they're not going to be continental things like that they're going to be very local you're you're talking about everything that you are going to eat wear use sleep on etc is going to come from an area of 20 miles or less usually because uh, farmers like farmers will bring their foot their stuff in they'll cart their stuff in that's gonna you know but they'll they won't like give it to a shipper and the shipper brings it over to you they'll bring it themselves and they'll come into the markets and sell it uh, you might have somebody who's a mer you know a traveling merchant they will go from city to city and like they might buy up a bunch of housewares in one city and then they go to a different city and they sell them there or if you have another city that's like really big on blacksmithing and they make the best swords in the world the merchant will go in there they'll buy them up and they'll take them out to somewhere else that doesn't have a really good uh, either does not have a good doesn't have it at all or if they have it it's not as good as this other city 
So they'll take like the the swords in one city and they'll buy them up, take them over and sell them in another city where they, you know, where they have a need. But again, you're talking, you know, if you actually ship something 100 miles, it has to be worth, some, you know, it has to really be worth something to be justifiable in, in shipping it that far. Um, you know, again, in sci-fi, yeah, you know, a couple thousand light years, no problem. Throw it on a ship, send it over there, and, and go for, go from there. Now, in, there, in that case, you know, you, you're still going to have that that whole idea of how far can I ship this and still keep it economically viable for me. But in that case, you're talking planets and star systems. You're going to have a lot bigger distance between point A and point B in that. Uh, when you're talking horse and carriage and things like that, it's going to be very localized you know within 100 100 miles at 100 miles in any direction maximum uh more realistically within 20 miles or less because being you know having grown up on a farm uh having to transport your product uh much beyond 20 miles is like uh <laughs> you know not a fun thing uh thankfully our our uh the uh Granary, her granary that we worked with, uh, grain silos, they were four or five miles away. So not that big of a haul for us, which was absolutely perfect. And that one, uh, that one granary served all the farmers in the area. They uh, there was one uh, in downtown Marshall that serviced all the people around the city of Marshall. Where I was at, they had. Uh, yeah, they had a granary that was just outside of the local village where we were we were a couple miles away from the village and it was a couple miles away from the village uh and it was you know it was servicing everybody there and he went down a bit further it's like about 10 miles 15 miles it was another granary there and that serviced all those farmers in that area and believe me the given the field sizes we had back then and even now that granary struggled to keep up with everything that was coming in at harvest time i mean these guys were just shipping stuff out of there like crazy just to keep from overflowing their uh their silos but anyways you know it's going to be kind of the same idea because you know if the farmer is bringing it in and selling it wholesale to somebody who will redistribute it from there out to other people you know or they're bringing it into a market to sell it uh like you see in a lot of you know fantasy books and novels and stuff like that uh, distance is a big decider on how much they bring, what they bring, uh, as well as you know the local needs. Do they need flour? Do they need beans? Do they need fresh vegetables? Do they need meat? Because uh, meat you have to consider in you know in a in a sci-fi. Yeah, you can butcher it, throw it in the freezer, and and go as far as you want to with it, so long as it you know so long as it's within a certain number of years, so that you're not getting freezer burn and the meat's getting damaged being in the freezer uh, but when you're talking about uh, when you're talking about fantasy your source to destination for meat has to be really short uh, like going back to this one this right here, uh, now these up here are cured meats. These are cured meats. These probably are not. Uh, but, you know, if you, a lot of them, you know, if they're going to go for a distance, uh, they're going to have, the meats are going to be cured before they go there because those will, those will hold for a couple years. Uh, and if somebody's going to store them, that's perfect. Uh, if they don't have them cured, you have to butcher the item within 24 hours of selling it uh, anything beyond 24 hours and the meat starts turning now I know some people that will like butcher a cow and hang it up for a week to let it cure well that's great if you have refrigeration otherwise you're gonna have a rot you know cow rotting on the on the hooks uh, so that meat has to be butchered fresh that day so sometimes you know like if it, unless it was cured meats like this it was something that you know that you brought it in you butchered it you sold it that day uh, and then the people who brought it home, uh, they either salted it and cured it themselves, or they ate it that day. Because you know, like I say, once it's butchered, you're you're on the clock. So again, something to think about. And and I'm giving you just the the basics here. Uh, you need to really think about this when you're doing your actual uh, 
when you're doing your story and your books and stuff like that because you know these are all details in your world that you need to think about uh, and you know it seems like it's a lot it's a lot of information overload and kind of is uh, but at the same time those details uh, will back your story immeasurably and it will you know, and these are these are things because you know everything you develop here does not have to go in the story. But it's things that, you know, the fact of like the the butcher and the and the meat, the cured meats versus the fresh meats, uh, that's going to drive how people sell the product, how people prepare the product, how people purchase it, how they use it. You know, do they go and buy it each, go down to the market each day and buy the food, bring it back and prepare it for for the daily, you know, the day's meals. Uh, is it something that they buy and bring home and stick on the shelf uh, for long term? Like, you know, because winter comes around, you ain't going to have these markets. You're going to have the stores which are heated, but you're not going to have the outside markets. The outside markets are going to be during the primary growing season. After, you know, once, the, once it gets cold and the snow starts flying, everybody's moving indoors. Uh, anybody that has a, has a uh, you know, one of these right here where they have a tent and they're selling in the street that's you know that's going to go away because like i say you know like with guys like this the you know the the produce is done for the year this guy ain't showing back up he's gotten his money for the for the year and he'll be good you know you won't see him again until uh you know the next harvest when the next things start coming up like berries and fruits and different things like that the spring vet you know the spring crops the summer crops the fall crops stuff like that so anyways um that's all I really have for this one. Uh, I've got other videos I'm going to be doing to tell about different world elements, but this is something, like I say, you really need to think about. Uh, even if you don't, you know, if you don't use this in your story, it's something you still want to keep in the back of your mind because it's going to be one of the, you know, the gears that runs in the gearbox is hidden under the floorboards that runs your story. Even if it's not up where people can see it, it's still going to run your story. Or it's going to be an imp important cog in the story to make everything work because uh, you know you could like I mentioned in other things you know feast and famine they they drive different behaviors in people they drive the rise and fall of empires uh, they drive you know social elements so anyways that's all I've got for this time and next time we'll uh, cover another one of our topics I got to decide what I want to cover next but be another thing to cover in uh, you know in the effort to you know in your efforts to build your worlds and write your books and create your stories and and stuff like that so anyways catch you guys next time